Hello and welcome to Crime Watch. We are live for the next 60 minutes with the latest crime investigations, news and appeals. We have got detectives from across the country standing by the phones, all hoping that you can help solve their cases tonight. Including the bizarre but terrifying knife attack on a grandfather after he lent a man his torch. The knife actually went in here at the back of the neck and came out at the front here. And I need your help to track down this lot amongst the men wanted in connection with robbery, rape and drug dealing. But we start tonight with the urgent hunt for a gunman who stormed into the Surrey home of entrepreneur Robert Stiff and his family. Robert was at work when it happened just a few weeks ago, unaware at the time of the terror his wife and his two daughters, one of them heavily pregnant, were facing. This is Kingswood. It's a peaceful commuter village in Surrey, and it's where entrepreneur Robert Stiff chose to buy his dream home for his wife and his grown-up children. Robert and his family are looking forward to the arrival of their first grandchild in just a few weeks, but what should be a happy time has been overshadowed by the violent actions of one man. We bought this home four years ago, and what we were really looking for was a real family home that you know we could all come into and really enjoy. We started the business from nothing. We were all really involved in the beginning, um, but as it grew, I took a more back seat. Robert works really hard um, for all of us, really. My daughter Katie, she's having her first um, baby, my first grandchild, in February. It's really exciting to know that I'm going to be an auntie. She's having a little girl as well, so that's even more exciting. I'll see you later. I'll see you later. I left for work around about 10 o'clock. Katie and I had decided to go and do some baby shopping, and then we came home around four-ish. Mum was making dinner, and I was sat with Kate at the table, and obviously she was really excited, showing me all the furniture that her and Mum had bought for the baby. It's really snuggly as well. Mum was like, oh, should we go and catch up on the soaps? Get on the floor! Get down! Watch his injury! Give them to me! I was taking them off and throwing them to his feet. And he whacked me. <laughs> You're just paralysed inside with... with fear. He is by your feet! He's by your feet! Where's the sun? Well, when he then put the gun to my cheek, I remember straining my eyes, looking at it as he's telling us to get up. I just felt everything drain from me, like, thinking, he could kill me, or worse, kill them. Take me to the safe right now! We're all in a line behind each other. Look at the floor! Move! Come on! I could actually feel Katie stroking my hands. Move it! <laughs> right, on your knees! <laughs> on your knees! Where's the children? Where's the safe? He made eye contact with me, and then he punched me. <laughs> My watch is on the side. <laughs> Face down on the floor, you two. Take me to the safe. Right now. <laughs> Where's the old man? I was thinking to myself, 
I really need this guy to go, so I lied. I spoke to him a half hour ago. He said he'll be back in 20 minutes. I'll shoot him first. If I find any more jewellery, I'll kill you. We never spoke to each other, didn't look at each other. It felt like he was looking around the house. Then he came back in, and that was when he tied us up. You're lying on the floor with your hands behind your back. You're completely helpless to yourself and everyone else. <laughs> he kicked me in the side. <laughs> and then he he went to Katie and he booted her in the side. <laughs> and I just thought, oh God, you know, what's gonna happen to that baby to the baby? And then he went round and he kicked Chloe. <laughs> I felt like he could hear my heartbeat. I felt like my body was moving off the ground from where my heart was just beating so fast. Detectives believe the attacker made his escape across nearby Kingswood Golf Course. He's armed, he's dangerous, and he needs to be caught. I managed to get one of my hands free. I think we just knew we needed to just barricade the door. Sorry, police, what's your emergency? We, we've been held up at gunpoint. What stored gun is it? It's a shotgun. OK. My daughter's been I don't think we'll ever be the same people that we were before. We don't care about what he took. I mean, at the end of the day, they're things that can be replaced. Because although what happened on that night was traumatic, it's the after effects of what he's left behind that's even worse. We loved our house, loved being here. He came in and you're reminded of that all the time. I think that's, that, that's probably the most upsetting part with Katie being pregnant. You know, at a time when really we should be celebrating it. There was so much sadness in the house. I think he's a coward. Sickening. Well, I'm joined now by DCI Anthony Archibald from uh, Surrey Police, who's leading the investigation. You've got some pretty good clues to go on here. We have, Kirsty, yes. Although the guy was masked, we do know he was a, a white man. He was six foot or over, and he had a very gruff South London accent. He was wearing what you saw like a, a dark coloured barber mm. type jacket. And the gun was a full length double barrel shotgun on the side by side. And what was interesting is the way he led the, the girls up the stairs in the single file, and we think this may suggest he's had some sort of form of military, military training. Oh, OK. And, and the stuff that he took, some of it actually pretty distinctive. Yeah, there's some really valuable items there, and mainly rings and watches, and some of them had serial numbers, and we need to speak to anyone who's been offered these items. We should let people know, of, of course, that they can look on the website if they want to have a look at the serial numbers and trace them maybe with something that they've been offered or something that they've bought. Um, potential witnesses are important here. Yes, we've got some CCTV of uh, a guy at Kingswood Railway Station who gets off the train at 3.27 and he, you see him there on the screen in yeah. dark clothing. He later leaves the station and then returns at about 6.47 the same day, which is right within the relevant time of the offence. We need to trace this guy because he may hold some valuable information. You've also got some CCTV for us to look at from Kingswood uh, Golf Club from the car park there. We have, yeah. This guy walks into the car park and he's, he appears to be with a black Ford KA. There it they, is. They yeah. drive, he drives around the car park and the guy on foot goes towards um, the back of the golf club. Now, the golf club backs onto Mr. Stiff's property, and we think this is where the offender sort of entered the property and left. So we're interested to speak to those two guys. We saw the appalling violence that was used entirely uh, without reason, and we saw that Katie was horribly abused there. How, how is the family? How are they all doing? Uh, the family are doing well. They're trying to move on from this. Um, yeah, they're doing really well. And they've stepped up security at their property considerably, we should tell people. They have. Thank you very much for joining us, Anthony. Just imagine that happening in your family, in your home. This man must be caught. You should know that there is a £60,000 reward for information that leads to his arrest and conviction. Please call the studio now. Do the right thing. 0500 600 600 if you can help in any way. Wanted Faces now with Martin. First up tonight is this man, Jason John McLaughlin. Detectives in Swansea want to question him in relation to an attack in which a man was stabbed seven times in his own home. The victim was also hit on the back of the head with a hammer in the attack, causing life-threatening injuries. McLaughlin has links to Liverpool and South Wales and will be 44 years old on Saturday. Next, we have Araf Mohammed, although he also calls himself Mohammed Araf. 
South Yorkshire police want to question the 67-year-old in connection with the attempted murder of a man in Sheffield. The victim suffered 16 stab wounds to his head and upper body in an attack with baseball bats, knives and a hammer. Detectives would also like to speak to three of Araf's sons, Basharat Mohammed, Nasarat Mohammed and Nasser Mohammed, in connection with the incident. Wanted face number three is 24-year-old Dominic Joseph McAnally. Detectives want to question him in relation to an organised crime group responsible for the wholesale supply of cocaine. McAnally has links to the Merseyside area and has a scar on the left side of his chin. And finally, for now, we have Jonathan William King, although he also calls himself the Colonel or Cat. He was sentenced to eight years for a burglary in which more than £50,000 worth of antique silverware was stolen. But during the trial, he was granted bail to go to hospital and went on the run. The 43-year-old has links to East Sussex and Kent and has numerous tattoos, including a star in each ear and a swallow on the left side of his neck. He's potentially violent, so if you know where he is, don't approach him, just dial 999. If you need to take another look, all the faces are on the website, and if you know where any of them are, call and text the numbers on screen. Calls are free from most landlines. Some networks and mobile operators will charge. Texts will be charged at your standard message rate. A roundup of the latest crime news now. And within the last few hours, police have arrested a man they wanted for questioning in connection with the murder of an off duty police officer. PC Neil Doyle died after an attack on a night out in Liverpool on the 19th of December. Two of his colleagues were also injured. Well, tonight, officers arrested 30 year old Timmy Donovan as he was preparing to board a plane in Germany. Two men have already appeared in court charged with PC Doyle's murder. Police today started DNA screening in West Sussex in the hunt for the killer of Valerie Graves. The 55-year-old grandmother was murdered while house-sitting for friends in Bosham on the 30th of December 2013. We featured a reconstruction on the programme last year. Detectives hope the voluntary DNA screening will help to eliminate people from the investigation. For more information, there is a special website, ValerieGravesMurder.com. Elsewhere, two men have been jailed for shooting at National Crime Agency officers in North London last May. This incredible footage shows Sadat Merich turning his gun on NCA officers after he'd opened fire at a pool hall in North London. He fired eight shots at them before running out of ammunition and giving himself up. Thankfully, no one was injured during the shooting on May the 23rd last year. Merich was sentenced to 15 years for possession of a firearm with intent to endanger life and six for possession of a firearm with intent to cause fear. His accomplice, Octay Anoglu, was jailed for 12 years for possession of a firearm with intent to endanger life. The NCA officers were commended for their bravery. Finally, a 23-year-old father has been jailed for four years for accidentally sending his son to nursery with a lunchbox full of cocaine. Lee Webb from Folkestone dropped his son off at the nursery, but rather than giving staff a bag containing the child's lunch, he handed over a bag containing Class A and Class B drugs. Well, realising his mistake, he asked for the bag back, but staff refused and called police. Officers found that the two plastic lunch boxes contained drugs worth between eight and twelve thousand pounds, as well as two knives and weighing scales. It's believed that in the UK alone, there may be as many as two hundred thousand victims of what's known as romance fraud every single year. Together, the victims are defrauded of an estimated one hundred million pounds annually. So tonight we have a special investigation into the problem and we reveal how undercover officers from British agencies were able to trace one particularly prolific scammer all the way to his luxurious mansion in West Africa. He was coldly targeting lonely ladies. They start paying you attention, you think you're the Queen of England. From beginning to end, it's all to do with money. Across West Africa, young men are going to extraordinary lengths to get hold of your cash. They're willing to exploit anyone, the vulnerable, the ill, the lonely. It made me feel wanted. Their key weapon, the romance scam. It's a grooming process. 
somebody goes online, they're looking for companionship, they're looking to meet somebody, and the person that they meet is not who they think it really is. Romance fraudsters are conning British victims out of an estimated £100 million a year. These criminals are determined, ruthless, and notoriously difficult to catch. In Portsmouth, 74-year-old Catherine was left devastated by a romance fraudster. It was 2004. I'd been on my own for a long time and uh, just felt it would be nice to share life with someone. Online, Catherine met Richard, who said he was a Polish builder from London. We were in touch all the time. But although romance blossomed, they never met face to face. He was away on building contracts, that's why we couldn't meet. Then Richard announced he was taking a new job in Ghana. The next message was from abroad. He'd gone. From Ghana, Richard got in touch with an investment offer, which he promised would transform Catherine's life. He wanted the sum of 30,000 to start off with. He told Catherine she would double her money and asked for another £40,000. But then there was a crisis. I got a call telling me that he had been arrested. She sent more money and even flew out to Ghana. Do you think you are doing the right thing? She wasn't allowed to see Richard, but she was shown boxes of gold and cash from her supposed investment. With that, I was taken to the airport and got on the plane and came home with nothing. And once back home, a concerned friend finally convinced her she was being duped. The realisation of what had taken place devastated me. Catherine had been scammed for over £150,000. Richard had never existed, and Catherine's life savings had been pocketed by a Ghanaian fraudster. It's taken my retirement, I still have to work, and it's devastated me in many, many ways. It is very, very difficult to deal with, because they've lost everything. Bitter, broken, you've got nothing. It used to be that romance fraudsters put personal ads in magazines and sent out letters. But now, it's also being done online, using dating websites, chat rooms and social media. And behind fake profile pictures and flirtatious chat lie ruthless criminal gangs. Of course, to the victim, they only ever see one person. But it is, it is organised crime. With romance fraud on the increase, a special unit was formed by Soccer, now part of the National Crime Agency, to trace the criminals behind the con. We had discovered that this problem was widespread in the UK, but it hadn't been picked up. We had to be able to show to police forces who wanted to investigate it, to victims who have been uh, defrauded of money, we can do something for you, and we will. The trail also led Colin to Ghana. These sacks represent all the scam mail that's been taken out. If one in a thousand answers, that's a lot of money to them. Crime Watch went undercover to see how the scam works. Well, hi, is that Reggie? <laughs> Posing as a businessman looking for love, a member of the team responded to a number of romance scam letters. I can't wait to meet you too. Guess After a month of communicating with three women, I'm in Ghana. Our reporter planned to meet his potential love interest in a hotel lobby rigged with secret cameras and under constant police surveillance. His first date is with Reggie. Hello. Hi. Hi. I'm good, how are you? I'm fine. How nice are you? Nice to meet you. Yeah, good, thank you. What? Who, who are you, sorry? Julian. Julian. I was expecting Reggie. Yes, Reggie. You are Reggie? Yeah. Oh, you look different from the photo. Yeah, you're long time. Completely. Yeah. Totally, it doesn't look like you at all. She's Chinese. She's obviously not the woman in the photo, and her real intentions soon become clear. You know, I want a ticket I'm in London. A ticket to London? Yeah. So you want to come to England? Yeah. You want me to buy your ticket? 
After 10 minutes, our undercover reporter reveals his suspicions. I don't think you're looking for romance. I don't think you're looking for love. No, I think you just want money. You're a fraudster. Caught out, she leaves. His next date is with a beautiful girl called Philomena, but she doesn't turn up. Three men do. She's not here because she's in a family meeting. They couldn't produce Philomena, but they did want paying for their expensive taxi journey. 800. Instead, our reporter confronts them. I work for the BBC. I don't believe you. I don't believe you. The men leave, only to find the police waiting outside. It was the same with the third and final date. Again, a man turned up, this time with a loaded 9mm handgun. We have had instances where people are kidnapped. It's very, very dangerous. These were organised criminal scams. Suspects were arrested and brought in for questioning. Back in the UK, Colin and his team had discovered a vital lead in exposing the identity of a prolific romance fraudster. In West Yorkshire, widow Dina White was ready to give her last penny to come to the aid of a man she had met online. He told me that his name was Steve Moon and that he was a retired army officer. He used to talk for two or three hours every night and sometimes during the day as well. But after just one month, Steve revealed he was in Iraq and asked Dina to lend him £45,000. I know this sounds very stupid looking back on it now, but I think I'd got so involved with Steve by this time, I probably would have sent him anything. Then Steve claimed he was being held hostage. I needed £120,000 to pay off these people. Well, I hadn't. I didn't have anything like that. The only thing I got is my house. Police were tipped off and arrived to warn Dina just days before the sale of her house went through. They told her the man she loved was the invention of a romance scammer. His photographs stolen from the internet. I'm just crying when nobody could see me. Sorry. But investigators soon realised that Dina's case was unusual. The money from a victim is normally sent via a money service bureau. Nobody knows really where it's gone. We had a really lucky break because Dina had sent her money into a bank. It was the crucial link to the fraudster behind the scam. The bank account led us to Morris Asola Fadola. In Ghana, police tracked down Fadola and arrested him. He had a, a mansion which he lived in. Fancy cars, fancy watches, clothes, all of the trappings of a criminal. But despite the massive scale of Fadola's fraud, proving he was the man behind the scam was no easy matter. We see these type of frauds on industrial proportions. The money invariably travels through money service bureaus, so there's a loss of accountability there and the problem itself is overseas from here. So in a case like this, I mean, how did you do it? We found computers, phones, SIM cards, passports, and bank accounts. And it was the bank account details which led us into it. Over a million pounds has gone through this bank account, all fraudulent, and this enabled us to further identify other victims. And going forward, what are the gaps that you have to close? We can't arrest our way out of this problem. We're working very closely with the dating sites and we're working very closely with the money service bureaus so that we can better trace these flows of money. So I can tell that a victim is a victim before they even know. Colin and his team had built a strong case on paper, but they also needed victims who were willing to face Fadola in court and give evidence against him. When I was asked if I would go out to, to Ghana to go to court, I agreed because I felt it was necessary that um, we gave our evidence against this man. In total, five of Fadola's victims testified against him. It was very tough for the witnesses. They had to open up their hearts again 
and relive all of that emotional problems and the roller coaster they had been through. I got outside and the reaction was floods of tears. I absolutely broke down. Ultimately, the Ghanaian court only accepted the evidence of the women who testified in person. Without the bravery of victims like Catherine, Morris Azola Fadola would have walked free. Instead, he was found guilty of over 20 offences, including deception and money laundering, and jailed for five years. But for Dina, this justice comes too late. She died without knowing whether the man who had stolen her money and shattered her hopes would ever be punished. We worked on this case for over six years. The court case alone took three years. And there was no way that we were going to give up. For so long, they weren't caught because nobody was looking for them. Now we've shown that it can happen. It will happen more and more. The problem is that for every one of these fraudsters painstakingly brought to justice, there are thousands of others trying their luck and getting away with it. He was running an army of people. Any one of those could stand up and say, we'll just go and do this on our own. There are more Fadolas out there, many more. Well, what about that? I'm joined now by Professor Monica Huissi, who is what's known as a cyber psychologist, and she's one of the UK's leading authorities on romance scams, and by Steve Prophet, the deputy head of Action Fraud. Welcome uh, to both of you. Uh, Monica, to you first. You've done some really pioneering research in this area. Can you just quantify the scale of this problem? Yeah, well, we found at least 200,000 victims in the UK every year become defrauded by this scam, and those are the individuals that know about it. It's both men, maybe slightly more men than women, all age groups, both heterosexual and homosexual, educated, non-educated, professional, non-professional. So it spans all of us and everywhere. Um, Steve, we live so much of our life online and that's increasing. This is not going to go away, this problem, is it? It's not going to go away. With the increasing use of the internet and social media, the opportunity for criminals to target victims is only going to increase. Um, well, we can hear briefly now from another very recent romance fraud victim, this woman who's asked to remain anonymous. Well, she met a man online last year. He told her that he was an American serviceman based in the UK and that he was about to leave for Syria. The messages and the letters were all very romantic. It was poetry, nice, loving letters, and it's something that a girl always dreams of, but you never ever have in reality. Then the demands for different amounts of money started to come through more and more. I just looked at the bank account and it was basically empty. I lost in the region of £50,000 altogether. I mean, that is a huge amount of money. What you heard there, does that in your mind, in terms of the research you've done, fit with the sort of classic stages of this sort of scam? Yeah, it does. What happens with the scam is that the victim meets a criminal on a dating site or social networking site. The criminal says to the victim they want to have an exclusive relationship with them, they're the perfect person for them, and they spend a lot of time grooming that individual. So they'll send instant messenger um, texts, they will email them poetry, phone them, and when they feel that that person is ready, they will ask for a gift to uh, test the waters or for a little bit of money, and then it might move to a crisis where they ask for a lot of money and they have to quickly respond to that. It can happen over a couple of months or over a couple of years. So it's very intense and, as you say, it's pretty sophisticated, this stuff. Let's hear again from our victim. This time she's talking about her feelings when she realised that she'd been scammed. Cross, devastated, upset, you know, how had I been taken for such an idiot, such a fool? I don't want to share it with my family because I think they would be very disappointed in me. And if they found out about this, they might disown me. So, Steve, that is a profound sense of guilt and a degree of shame that this woman is feeling. What happens then when these victims sort of, you know, they, they turn the guilt in on themselves, really? 
Yes, well, we would say, please, don't feel guilty, don't feel stupid. You've heard anybody can be a victim of this. What we need you to do is to report this matter to Action Fraud so that we can get your information, get your intelligence and link together to give law enforcement a chance of apprehending these criminals. Um, we saw in our film there the involvement of money bureaus. They tell us that they're trying to tighten up their procedures. Um, what can people do if they think that they have been the subject or are currently involved Involved in one of these kind of scams. Okay, if the alarm bells are ringing and there are key indicators of that, certainly as soon as somebody asks you for money, the alarm bell should ring. Do not send money. Don't do it. Look at our website, Action Fraud, and take the advice and guidance from there. But more importantly, if you have any doubts, ask a close friend what they think because they're not emotionally involved with you and they might be able to give you advice and guidance that prevents you from losing money in these situations. And they've got your best interests at heart. Steve, Absolutely. Monica, thank you very much indeed. If you're concerned about someone who may have fallen for this sort of crime or indeed you yourself have been a victim, you can report it as we heard online at actionfraud.police.uk anytime or by calling 0300 123 2040 during daytime hours. Still to come tonight, the grandfather stabbed on his doorstep. He came across as very well educated, very well brought up. He apologised profusely. Really dreadfully sorry. And the top Formula One team's trophy cabinet decimated by thieves. When you see the contempt that they've shown by throwing trophies on the floor and the lack of interest that they have, they haven't appreciated what they are, what they stand for or what the value is to, to the team. You'll want to see the pictures. That's coming very soon. But first, Martin has his latest batch of CCTV. Yes, and we start with a really horrific attack on a shopkeeper in Bradford. Be warned, some of these images are pretty nasty. It's just before closing time at this small shop in Bradford in May last year. The owner is cashing up for the day as he chats to a female member of staff. Suddenly, four men burst into the store. One picks up a bottle of wine. If you look closely, you can see a machete in his other hand. He immediately launches an attack on the shopkeeper. The victim fights back. Look again. You can see the robber drops the wine and lashes out with the machete, which you can clearly see here. As the robbers flee, the victim tries to throw a bottle, not realizing his thumb has been severed in the attack. Bleeding badly, he falls to the floor and presses the panic alarm. The victim suffered lacerations to his head and back. His thumb had to be permanently removed. He's not been able to work since. Who are the vicious thugs responsible? Names, please. This woman is returning home shortly after 6.30 p.m. on a Monday evening in November last year, followed just moments later by this man, who seems in a hurry to catch up with her, but he's no good Samaritan. This grainy camera footage shows her as she walks, unaware she's being followed. The man hangs around and then calls for his two friends to join him. As the victim waits for the lift doors to close, the man pounces. He lunges for her and grabs her bag. His accomplice, who's wearing a single blue latex glove, then joins in as the victim is dragged to the floor and pushed to the front of the lift, smashing her head against the door. The whole incident lasted just seconds, but has left the victim still traumatized months later. Who are these cowardly bag snatchers? It's the early hours of a Saturday morning in July, and just on the left of your screen, you can see an altercation taking place. Suddenly, one of the men lashes out, punching the victim in the face. He falls to the floor, and as he lies unconscious, he's kicked in the ribs. The victim's female friend tries to defend him, pushing the attacker away and shouting. The thug waits for his mate before they calmly walk away, leaving the victim still lying on the pavement. Police believe the men are seen here walking over a nearby bridge. One seems to reenact the attack whilst the other high-fives him. The victim suffered horrific injuries in the attack, including a broken eye socket which required a metal plate in his face. 
Do you recognize the attacker and his friend? You know what to do. It's just before 11 a.m. on a Tuesday at the end of November. Now watch closely as a pair of callous thieves target an elderly couple in Coventry. The man in the distinctive jumper crosses the road as the husband and wife in their 80s put their shopping and the lady's handbag into the boot of their car. Meanwhile, another man in a black padded jacket can be seen hanging around in the road. As the man in the jumper distracts the couple asking for directions, his sneaky friend edges closer to the car. He gets nearer and nearer as the other man continues to distract the pensioners. Seconds later, though, he spots an opportunity and creeps in to snatch the handbag. Audaciously, he opens it up right next to the couple, takes out an envelope and walks away, closely followed by his accomplice. The envelope contains £700 in cash, which the couple had earlier withdrawn from a building society to pay for Christmas. Police believe these are the men responsible seen earlier in a supermarket. Help us put names to them tonight. If you need another look, all the CCTV is on the website. You can also press red on your remote now to see the wanted faces and CCTV again. That's available until midnight tonight. Call and text the numbers on screen if you can help. Let's grab a quick word with DCI Anthony Archibald now, who's investigating that terrifying burglary at a family home of the entrepreneur Robert Stiff in November. Anthony, what has come in? We've had a few calls, two of which have given the same name for the potential witness at the railway station, which is excellent. But what I've not had yet is that vital bit of information regarding the attacker. And if people can just look back at that description, the really gruff South London accent, and also the really uh, identifiable jewellery that, that's been stolen. And just let's not forget, this attacker, he kicked a heavily pregnant woman in the stomach. Well, we're looking uh, at that witness uh, on the screen. Uh, so, uh, interesting details that have come forward. Don't forget pictures of the jewellery on our website and a £60,000 reward on this one, Kirsty. Well, Christmas is well and truly over now, but for Philip Hay and his wife, it's a time of year that brings back well, really terrible memories. Two years ago, last December, they were babysitting their two week old grandson for the first time when a knock at the door turned into a shocking and bizarre murder attempt. about 16 years ago with our two sons. It's always struck us as being quite a quiet and pleasant road to live in. Because we are so private at the back of the house um, and there's no there's nobody next door on one side, um, we've always felt quite at ease. It was the run-up to Christmas and Philip and Sally were spending the evening at home looking after their baby grandson. It was a Saturday night, just two weeks after he was born. It was the first time we'd, we'd had him overnight. Did the usual things, bathed him, gave him his bottle. After that, we were just sitting watching the TV. Until we saw the, the, the red laser. Hang on. I just assumed it's some kids playing about. Because we'd had that before, when there's functions at the rugby club, Young kids there get a bit bored. That's what we assumed it was. I had a quick look. Couldn't see anything. Couldn't hear anything. Probably just kids. stood there, about 19, 20 years old, very smartly dressed. I'd never seen him before in my life. I'm really terribly sorry, but I think my little brother's been pointing his laser pen into your house. He came across as very well educated, very well brought up. You know, he apologised profusely. Really dreadfully sorry. I was feeling quite irritated about it because it flashed in the baby's eyes. We've got a two-week-old baby you were trying to get down. He was very nervous and anxious, and he was almost backing away from me. 
Philip asked him to come inside. I wanted him to see the baby and then maybe just to apologise to my wife for disturbing her. There was nothing intimidating about him at all. I'm really terribly sorry. That's OK. I had no reservations at all about bringing him into the house. Then he just turned back to me and said, would it be OK if I just have a quick look down the garden just to see if my brother's there? The odd thing he said then was, because he's got a knife, and if I don't find the knife, I'll be in trouble. In my mind, I just assumed this little kid had maybe just got a normal knife that you'd eat your dinner with and was maybe digging in the grass with it or something. I'll get the torch. They searched the garden, but found nothing. He just said he was going to go and have a look in the rugby field, so I just said to him, take my torch, just bring it back when you're finished and leave it on the doorstep. Unfortunately not, and I'm afraid I've flattened your battery. No problem. I bent down to pick the torch up off the doorstep. absolutely covered in blood it was dripping onto the floor and, and I could feel it pumping out. Sally! I thought, right. Sally! I've got a few minutes to sort this out or I'm going to be dead. Please, somebody's just appeared at the back door and stuck a knife to my husband's neck. I've got a new baby here. Get somebody here, please. Please, I'm so frightened for him. Philip was stabbed through the neck. Miraculously, the knife missed his major arteries and windpipe by just a few millimetres. The knife actually went in here at the back of my neck and came out at the front here. I feel extremely lucky that I did survive it a millimetre either way and I, it would have been a completely different story. The injury caused nerve damage, but while Philip has made an almost complete recovery, the attack has also left mental scars. I think it's made us more cautious simply because it did happen to us and it happened here. And I've never done anything to upset anybody to an extent that I want to do that. So, yeah, the, 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 the lasting question in my mind is why did he need to do it? He committed an unprovoked attack on, the, on an innocent random person. If he's not caught, then there's always a chance that he could do the same to somebody else and they might not be as lucky as me. Truly shocking. DCI Liz Belton is running this investigation. Thanks for taking the time to join us. A very bizarre set of circumstances, and this was truly a frenzied attack on a man who was just trying to be helpful. Yes, it's an absolute horrific attack, uh, what appears to be motiveless, which occurred on Saturday the 15th of December 2012 in uh, Wagon Lane in Bingley, which was close to the local rugby ground. Now, the injury, this was, I mean, not a lucky man in many ways, but lucky insofar as this was a life-threatening injury. It was a life-threatening injury, and tonight, for the first time, we're showing this footage, which has been taken from officers who attended moments after the attack. So he was very lucky that the knife from sort of millimetres um, has prevented his death. Really terrible. We can see the state that he's in uh, there. In terms of what you know, you, I mean... It looks like a pretty good e-fit of this guy. Just take us through his description. Yes, the e-fit appears to be a good likeness, and the description is of a white male, aged 19 to 20 years of age, approximately six foot tall, medium build, well-spoken, and was wearing a dark pattern jumper at the time of uh, this incident. A very, very dangerous young man. Who, who are you appealing to tonight? Who do you need to come forward? We'd appeal to anybody who's got any information in relation to the incident itself. 
in particular families, friends that have, may have uh, witnessed some odd behaviour of the person that's responsible. We'd ask that people come forward and give us names of a possible suspect in relation to this. We've got forensic evidence that we can eliminate people quite easily from this inquiry. Saturday the 15th of December, maybe somebody came home with blood on them, acting unusually, that sort of thing. We want people to keep an eye out and to get in touch. If you can help, please call the studio now on the usual number. You know it. It's 0500 600 600. Or, of course, you can speak anonymously to Crime Stoppers if you'd rather. 0800 treble 5 treble 1. And if you've been a victim of crime, you can call the victim support line. Their number, 0808 08 16 89 triple 1. Still to come tonight, the Infinity Red Bull Formula One team won a lot of races back in 2012, but now their hard-earned silverware has been stolen. We're going to have exclusive footage of the Ram Raiders in action. But first, time for some more wanted faces, starting with 27-year-old David Jones. Detectives want to question him in connection with threats made to a man via phone and text, in which he was told he'd be shot in the face. Jones has gold surrounding one of his upper teeth and a tattoo of the letters PJ on the right side of his neck. He also has a scar on the knuckles of his right hand. He has connections across southeast London and is described as dangerous. So call 999 if you know where he is. Next is 27 year old Craig Johnson, or Craig Davis, as he's also known. Detectives want to question him in relation to the rape of a woman in Brighton and numerous fraud offences where women have been duped into taking out loans or mobile phone contracts. Johnson has connections to Brighton, Eastbourne, Manchester, Northumberland, Liverpool, Essex and Cheshire. He has numerous tattoos including a cross on his back and R.I.P. Louise on his left arm. Number seven tonight is Matthew Waters, although he also uses the nickname Maples. He was jailed for six years after robbing a woman on her way to cash in the day's takings from the garage where she worked. Waters was released from prison on licence but has failed to stick to his conditions and is now wanted back in jail. The 30-year-old is six feet tall and of stocky build. He has links to Pontypool in South Wales. And finally, this is 29-year-old James Thomas Flood. Detectives want to question him after firearms were recovered from a house in Liverpool in August last year. They included a pump-action shotgun, two machine guns, a handgun and ammunition. Flood has links to the Merseyside area and speaks with a local accent, but officers believe he could now be anywhere in the country. Call and text on the usual numbers if you recognise any of tonight's faces. And of course they're all online as well as on the red button until midnight. Now some updates uh, starting with some excellent news on a wanted face that we showed you last month. 32-year-old Paul John Scott was wanted for a conspiracy to import Class A drugs from South and Central America into the UK. Well, just two weeks after we showed the appeal, he was arrested after he flew into an airfield in Norfolk from the Netherlands in this light aircraft. Well, Scott today pleaded guilty at Liverpool Crown Court to conspiracy to import drugs. He was sentenced to 14 years in jail. The Dutch pilot, who was arrested on suspicion of money laundering, has been bailed pending further inquiries. Next, news that 50 people have been jailed for a total of more than 75 years following the English Defence League disturbances in Birmingham in June 2013. We showed this footage on the programme as part of that huge police investigation and detectives say your information was vital in bringing many to justice. Well, this man, Dean Kenny, pleaded guilty but failed to turn up for sentencing at Birmingham Crown Court. A warrant has been issued for his arrest and he will now be sentenced on January the 30th, whether he turns up or not. If you know where he is, please call on the usual number. Next, you may remember this CCTV of an armed robbery at a post office in Bletchingley in Surrey. The robber raided the post office on New Year's Eve in 2013, tying up two members of staff, a man in his 30s and a woman in her 50s, and threatening them with what's now known to have been a BB gun. Well, as a direct result of our appeal, officers received information which led them to this man, Daniel Arthur Brady. He admitted two counts of robbery and one of attempted robbery, and he was sentenced last month to life imprisonment. Great result. 
In March of last year, we showed you this man, John Fletcher. Now, police wanted to speak to him about the theft of thousands of pounds worth of valuables from gym and leisure centre lockers across the country. Well, following our appeal, he was recognised by staff at a hotel and arrested by City of London police. Now, Fletcher admitted 27 offences and was sentenced last month to two years at the Old Bailey. Now, you may remember an appeal we featured on last month's programme about the murder of father of three, Sean James, who was deliberately run over and killed in Cinderford back in 2002. Well, as a result of that appeal, new information received by Gloucestershire Police has led to the seizure of a large white van, which police suspect may have been involved in that offence. The van is undergoing detailed forensic examination. And I should tell you that Crime Stoppers have now added £5,000 to the original £5,000 reward for information that leads to the arrest and conviction of whoever was responsible for Sean's murder. Finally, police have charged three men with the murder of Joseph Burke Monoville in February 2013. We featured the case after Joseph was shot dead while sitting in a car in Hackney in East London with his identical twin brother and his older brother. Three men aged 19, 20 and 27 were remanded in custody at the Old Bailey in December. We'll keep you updated on any progress. Now this, as you can probably tell, is an Infinity Red Bull Formula One car. The team uh, won an impressive seven Grand Prix during the 2012 season. Well, in Formula One, each win takes an enormous amount of work by engineers and by support staff. It's pretty clear what it means to the drivers when they receive uh, the rather impressive trophies on the podium after each race. After all the champagne has been sprayed, the Red Bull team display their hard-earned trophies in a cabinet at their headquarters in Milton Keynes. But just before Christmas, a gang ran raided the building, targeting the team's huge collection. Well, DCI Vince Gray from Thames Valley Police is leading the investigation into the theft. Good evening. Good Just evening. take us through what it was that happened here. Yeah, on the early hours of the, uh, the 6th of uh, December, which was a Saturday, uh, a team ran raided the uh, front reception area of the Red Bull Racing, uh, broke into the trophy cabinet and uh, stole a number of trophies. Uh, we've got some CCTV that we're going to show people for the first time tonight. This is being made public. And just talk us through it precisely. What are we watching? Yeah, that's great. Right, I mean, from the clip, you'll see that two cars arrive. The first one is a Subaru. Uh, the second one is a black Mercedes M-Class. Uh, and you'll see in the clip as we watch that the Subaru reverses into the reception area uh, of Red Bull Racing. Yeah, there we go. Oh, and right through the doors, yeah. Yeah. It then drives out to allow access to uh, uh, the offenders that come in. And as we can see, they sort of discriminately break into the cabinet, remove a number of trophies. Um, they've got shovels and pickaxes with them. A um, number of trophies are thrown onto the floor, and we think they're taking the higher value, what they believe to be higher value, because of the, the weight of the trophies and the metal itself, and leave a number of other items behind. And as you can see, they sort of get into the vehicles uh, and make good their escape. Um, now, Vin, some of your team, you, you have recovered some of the stuff uh, that was taken, and you think some of the other... Uh, pieces have been sold on for scrap, yeah? Yes, um, on the same day, um, at a lake just on the, uh, the Berkshire and Hampshire border, which is about 60 uh, miles from Milton Keynes, as you can see from the clip here, which is from a, a police body uh, worn camera. Uh, a gentleman found some trophies on the side of the lake and some that were just inside the lake. So, yes, we have recovered some, but some still remain outstanding. Uh, now, although those trophies do have a pretty small, it has to be said, scrap value, they are irreplaceable for the Red Bull Racing Team and the team principal, Christian Horner. Well, for everybody involved, winning a trophy is, you know, you've taken on the best in the world. You've taken on Ferrari, McLaren, Mercedes, you know, these fantastic teams, and, and you've achieved the pinnacle, the pride that is carried and represented in those trophies, irrelevant of their shape or size or, or material, is is immense. When you see the contempt that they've shown by throwing trophies on the floor and the lack of interest that they have, they haven't appreciated what they are, what they stand for, or what the value is to, to the team. It was a, a pointless crime, the value of which, you know, these, these trophies is minimal um, uh, in terms of the raw material, but the emotional value is, is, is huge and it'd be great to see those trophies back in their rightful home here in Milton Keynes. So we saw from earlier that some of those um, uh, 
trophies were recovered. We see some of the damaged items here, but th yes. there are some still missing. Which ones? Yeah, are some for? are still outstanding. Uh, we have three bottoms here for um, trophies that were won at the Suzuka Grand Prix, uh, first and second place, and the constructors' trophy. Um, they're still outstanding. Um, amongst with some others, but as I say, these are some of those that recovered damaged. You think the gang that we saw in the CCTV footage have been up to some other stuff as well, some other crimes? Yes, in the weeks leading up to uh, this offence, that the, in particular the black Mercedes, we believe, was involved in a number of crimes, uh, particularly in Surrey. Uh, there is uh, an image of a gentleman that we're particularly keen to, to trace uh, and speak to, who we link to a number of jobs, uh, predominantly um, a clothes shop in Farnham, and uh, the removal of a cash machine from a supermarket in uh, Surrey as well. Right, there is a reward, is there? There is a reward, which is £10,000 for um, any information and the, uh, leading to a conviction. Okay, DC Ivan Scray, thanks very much for updating us on all of that. If you can help in any way with this one, then please do get in touch in all the usual ways. Uh, just time now then for a final check on what's come in on the phones. Let's go over to Martin. Well, let's focus straight away on that aggravated burglary in Surrey. You've already heard that some calls are coming, giving a name of the potential witness seen at the train station. Now detectives want to try and get a name for those seen at the Kingswood golf course. The first wanted face we showed you today was Jason McLaughlin. A number of really good calls on this, potential sightings, one of particular interest. Araf Mohammed, he was the second wanted face that we showed you tonight. Again, some excellent calls coming in which are being followed up, including some potential new leads. Now, unfortunately, we've also had calls from people who say they may be victims or potential victims of the romance frauds. Please keep those calls coming in. And the phones are busy. Uh, that's everything for now. But remember, all of tonight's appeals, including the police incident room phone numbers, are on the Crime Watch website. You can also take another look at Martin's wanted faces on CCTV by pressing the red button on your remote. And that's available until midnight tonight. And, of course, you can keep up to date with how all of our cases progress via Twitter. Follow at BBC Crime Watch. The phone lines are going to stay open until midnight tomorrow. We're going to be back with an update programme after the news tonight. Please do check local listings for exact timings in your area. But for now, thanks for your calls. They really do make a difference. Keep trying. Bye-bye.